And please welcome Fara Warner. Very welcome. Hi. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thanks You've for been interested me. to hear about uh, digital storytelling. Yes. And I think a lot of we have a lot of internet retailer entrepreneurs here today, and I think a lot of them. Uh, are actually they are very strong in many areas, but I think uh, very few of them are good in in uh, making a point of their storytelling. Okay, well, I'm going to try and give you some tips and tools um, and some food for thought. That sounds great. Stage is yours. Great, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I know it's mid afternoon and the slump is on, and you're ready for coffee. And but bear with me. Um, let's start back here. So when I started thinking about this speech, I, I, I'm not a futurist, nor do I cast myself as one. But I was really thinking about what do I want to talk about in the world of the future of publishing. So I work at the Wall Street Journal, um, which is part of News Corp. So I think a lot about publishing. I think a lot about storytelling because that's my craft. I'm a journalist, um, but in my present job, I really think about branded content, native content. So I create, along with my team, branded content programs for some of the world's largest advertisers. So everything from Morgan Stanley to Mini um, to Narcos and the Netflix brand. So I'm going to take you through some of those um, those storytelling immersives. But first of all, I really want to talk about. I want to go back to the beginning, way back to the beginning, which is sort of way, way back. Is that humans are natural-born storytellers? We love to tell story. There are people out there right now telling stories to each other. They're looking at each other eye to eye. They're spending time with each other, um, and so we all, as humans, are really natural-born storytellers. It's the way that we engage with people, um, and we've been natural-born storytellers. Since the beginning of time, language, any of our languages, are really about the ability to tell what's going on in our mind to another human being. Stories are not facts. Stories are not marketing. Stories, in fact, are not advertising. So, for instance, if I say to you these three following facts: I have a grandmother. She had a frying pan, and there was a bear. You're intrigued, right? You're thinking, what does a grandmother, a frying pan, and a bear have to do with anything? Those are three facts. They're th three real facts. And if I just went on, you'd probably be, I hope, be asking me later on. So, what happened with your grandmother and the frying pan and the bear? Well, I'm going to tell you because my grandmother was one of my most favorite storytellers, and she would sit at her kitchen table and tell me a story. And that, if you, as as mentioned, are retailers, e-commerce, you may get caught up in the transaction of selling something to someone, but things always start with a story. So I'll tell you my story about my grandmother. It's just one of many stories. So my grandmother、um, lived in Utah, which is a state in the United States. How many of you know where Utah is? Wow, more people than I thought. Most people think Iowa, Ohio, Utah. So my grandmother lived on a farm in eastern Utah,、um, and during the summers she would work as a cook camp up in the high Uintas, which are these beautiful mountains、um, in eastern Utah.、Um, during the summers there was logging、um, going on, there was trailblazing going on. This is in the 1930s, the 1940s, the 1950s in America. So she was the cook camp, the camp cook, and every morning she would get up and make breakfast, and then lunch, and then dinner, and she'd start all over the next day. So one morning, very early in the morning, she hears something in the cook tent, and she thinks, "Oh, it's just one of the guys. He's ready for he's ready for his breakfast, and he just can't wait." But then the sounds are larger, and she's not really sure what she should do. So she picks up her number twelve frying pan, which is really heavy, because I still have it. Um, and you kind of—I have to pick it up with both hands. My grandmother actually could pick it up with just one hand. So she goes storming into the tent, and there's a grizzly bear. And she stops, and the grizzly bear stops, 
And before she knows what she's really thinking, she takes that frying pan and she just hits the bear on the nose with it. The bear looks at her, runs away. She turns around, goes back to her tent, sits down for a few minutes, and then proceeds to go about her day, cooking breakfast, cooking lunch, cooking dinner. That's a story, right? And my grandmother used to tell me that story over the kitchen table time after time after time. And so I grew up with this marvelous story of her, which isn't just about her and what happened, but it also tells me a lot about the human being that she was, how courageous she was, how brave she was. And if she was here today telling this story, it'd be a lot funnier than the story that I'm telling you. But we have to remember that our language was created for us to get what's in our minds out and tell you a story. And we love stories as human beings. But what's really interesting about the human language, any language, is that we can only, you're lucky today because I've got a microphone on so you can hear me in the back of the room. But human language, unlike say whale song, which can be heard over thousands of miles under the ocean, or birds even, that you can hear from miles away, human beings really are meant to see eye to eye when they tell us their stories. Our voices aren't that loud, right? So what do we do as humans who can speak, who love to tell story, what comes next? What do we do to amplify and extend our story? We have to amplify them. We have to add something to them. And I will contend that all the way through to the virtual reality that I'll talk about in a few minutes is all about what human beings are also good at, which is creating tools. We're great tool builders. We love to talk, and we like to build tools, and we have big brains, and we have opposable thumbs, and you put those two things together, and it's a wicked combination that has built sort of the world that we live in. Um, but we have to remember that for the most part, for generations and generations, story was told eye to eye, face to face, over a fire, sitting in chairs like this, talking to people. It wasn't told with the disintermediation of a screen. It wasn't told through the disintermediation, really, even of a book. Um, we had traveling messengers. Messengers left cave drawings. They left hieroglyphics. They left signposts. But most of the time, we were telling our story through eye-to-eye -eye communication. And so we needed to think about how do we amplify ourselves? How do we extend ourselves? And so we got to our wandering minstrel. So I'm intrigued always by wandering minstrels, particularly today, because I like to think of them as the first podcasters. These were the guys who took a musical instrument and added natural sound to their stories and music and made it far more interesting for everybody. And these people walked the streets, they walked the villages, they walked many, many miles taking their stories, their myths, their fables, their parables, and telling people about them. So that's the first amplification. I tell you a story, my grandmother tells me a story, I tell you that story, later on you're gonna tell that story, or you might tell your own story. And so that amplification starts with person-to-person -person communication. But that's probably not enough. And I'm not going to take everybody through sort of a, a history lesson in how we got from the printed book to the internet, um, because that could take a while. But we went from wandering minstrels to illuminated manuscripts to books. The Gutenberg Press is often sort of seen as the first functioning way of taking knowledge and extending it so far out. And lest we not forget that every tool that we've created to extend and amplify our voices has a business point to it. There are the economics of selling all of this as well. You know, the first printed book wasn't just printed for the sake of printing it, it was probably printed to sell it and to make money off of it. So we've also been making money off of our stories for thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. So there's always a business case to be made for this. And so we get ourselves from the wandering minstrels to the printed book to the 20th century. 
This is our little television with its color screen. In the 20th century, things just started to escalate. And I know there's been a lot of discussion about the speed of change during this conference. So we go from telegraph to radio to television to the internet to everything that we have. All of the, the amazing machine that most of you are holding in your hands right now and looking at, which we like to call our cell phone, um, is just another way of communicating, just another tool to amplify our story and amplify our voices. And so we need to think about, I believe, all of these tips and tools and infographics and narrative immersives and all of the things that we seem to be building up and saying these are going to be disruptive. And of course, virtual reality, which is incredibly potential, has the incredible potential to do amazing storytelling. But at the end of the day, if you don't take away anything other than this, it is story plus tool plus amplification. However you get to there, it's always, I contend, about the story. The internet in its almost infinite web, I think has gotten us into a place where it gets so much credit for disrupting everything. It's disrupted business models, it's disrupted storytelling, it's disrupted retailing, it's disrupted everything. And yet the internet is just one more tool that we've created to tell our story. And it certainly is a powerful tool to tell our story. But again, as I contend, story has not essentially changed. We will always love, once upon a time, this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. And we will always want to tell those stories over and over and over again. Because intriguingly, not only are we natural born storytellers, not only do we love to make tools but we actually chemically love story. So there's a researcher in the United States, his name is Paul Zak. Um, he's done a TED talk, um, if you ever wanted to engage with it, um, where he talks about how bodies release oxytocin when you hear a story. And oxytocin makes humans feel good. It makes us feel very approachable and that we can approach someone. So the intriguing thing is, that story is actually embedded in our neurochemical process. We are sort of a, a hive of wonderful hormones and chemicals telling us that story is really the way that we interact with each other. And so I bring you to sort of the heart of my, my discussion, which is, so what does this mean? What does it mean for me and what does it mean for you? And how can I help you understand a bit more about the storytelling that I do and what I've learned over the past two years? So I started out as a traditional print journalist. Um, I've been around for a pretty long time. I've been around since before the internet, um, since before cell phones, um, since before a lot of things, although not quite color television. Um, and so I started out my career as a traditional print journalist telling story. First for the Wall Street Journal, and then I left, and I went to Fast Company, and I worked for the New York Times, and then I taught storytelling. And now I find myself back at the Wall Street Journal as the global content director of WSJ Custom Studios. So I have this front row seat at trying to determine how do we create great story for brands, which is my job, that will engage with our audience, connect with our audience, and hopefully actually sell something to them? Because at the end of the day, that is my job right now, even though I'm a journalist, a storyteller, and I think story should be enough. But as we look out to 2021, the numbers don't lie. $50 billion will be spent on custom content, native content, branded content, whatever you want to call it, as more and more advertisers dive very, very deep into the concept of storytelling, as opposed to traditional advertising, traditional marketing, traditional selling. Because they've actually found that a great story sells things. So if IKEA, for instance, I think is a, is a great storyteller. The concept that you think about people as opposed to 
a transaction. How do you think about you know, your homes? They tell story almost visually if you walk into their stores. They set things up to make you feel, I could be in that place, I could have that kitchen, I like the way that that bedroom looks. They're sort of these small little visual stories. And so over the next few minutes, I'm going to take you through three programs that we've created over the past two years since I've been at the Wall Street Journal. And the first one is this. So Cocainonomics has a great story behind it. The Wall Street Journal Custom Studios in April and May of 2015 was an also ran in the content business. The New York Times T brand studio, I will say, was kind of eating our lunch. And as a very competitive journalist who had tried to beat the New York Times for years and years and years in stories, we sort of felt like it was time that we, you know, staked our claim. And so I don't know how many of you know what Netflix does in terms of branded content, but they're very well known for not doing traditional advertising for their programs. So their first one um, was a branded content program that appeared in the New York Times that was all around the American prison system. It was a great story. It was basically an advertisement for Orange is the New Black, a program about the American prison system. So the brass ring for a, lot of ad, for a lot of people like me in custom studios was to win another Netflix program. But Netflix didn't really look at us as being sort of the place that they would want to go to. So we got wind of the fact that they were coming out with a new program called Narcos, which follows for its first um, two seasons Pablo Escobar and the growth of the Colombian cocaine trade. And we decided that even though we have not been RFP'd for this, we have not been invited formally to come in, that we're just going to sort of do it all and go out to California and present to them cocaineonomics. And we did. Long story short, they loved the idea, and we ended up creating a program for them. So the first thing that I love about this program is um, this is... I, I decided not to take you guys through the sites. I can certainly give you the URLs for them later. Um, but I always, I've also been told that people actually listen better when they're not trying to read something. So I'm working on that assumption. So this is the opening scene of Cocaineonomics. Um, if you're on desktop, you can actually cut that cocaine into lines. So code becomes a story. So using WebGL engages you and gets you to sort of think about, how, OK, how do I cut a line of cocaine? Which for most people, they've probably never done before. Um, and then it scatters and comes back together. And then as you scroll up through the site, you first get an immersive story, which tells the story in very Wall Street Journal fashion of the, the economics of the illegal drug trade over the past 50 years, the movement of cocaine from Colombia into the United States, its biggest market. You keep scrolling down, and there's beautiful video that pops up as you're, you know, the parallax is really nice, and then you hit this area that's an interactive infographic that shows you the global drug trade over the past 40 years. So you get to watch as little boats fly up from Colombia and into the Caribbean and drop, um, drop cocaine in Norman's Key, only to be picked up by boats to be sent up into Miami to then scatter across the United States. Then later on, over the decades, you start to see that same cocaine put onto trucks, move up through Central Europe, cent sorry, through Central America, and then up into Mexico on mules and donkeys and horses and then carried in on foot by human beings into the world's largest market for cocaine, the United States. And finally, the one that I loved, which was the use of submarines to actually move cocaine from Colombia to West Africa to serve the European markets for cocaine. Now, who would have thought a company like Netflix would have said, this is the best possible way for people to actually start thinking about watching Narcos. But in fact, it was. Because the more that you got involved in Pablo Escobar's life, the more you learned about this man, the more that you looked at what had happened in Medellin over the past 30 years, going from the world's murder capital to being one of the most lively, cultured cities in the world today. You got invested in this. 
you started thinking, this is really awesome, this is really interesting. And oh, by the way, we can drop a pixel onto our page to tell you whether you then actually head over to Netflix and sign up for a subscription. Because if you looked at the Venn diagram of Wall Street Journal readers who actually had a Netflix subscription, it was actually pretty low. Like our audience wasn't big into Netflix. So while it was great storytelling, it also led to e-commerce. It led to people signing up for a subscription. So that was our sort of claim to fame and continues to be one of my most favorite programs that we've created. Um, it won a Can Lion, it's won a bunch of other things. And then I got to do not the same thing, but something very different last year. So sorry, this one is not as easy to see, nor does it have the most sort of amazing um, cocaineonomics at the top. Last year, um, probably about this time, Mini USA RFP'd us, so Mini, the little cars, um, Mini USA RFP'd us for a program that would follow their road rally that they do every two years in the United States. So Mini doesn't actually do a lot of focus groups. What they do is they take people out on the road to every two years, drivers sign up, and you drive around the country, 18 days, thousands and thousands of miles. What they do in every single one of these road rallies is they also bring along a philanthropic partner. So last year's partner was Feeding America, which is America's largest food bank. And what they were looking for, what many really wanted to achieve, which you can see up there, 1.124 million meals, they wanted to raise money for food banks in the United States. Their goal was 800,000 meals. They totally went over their goal of providing enough money to Feeding America to get um, up to 1.12 million meals. But what was interesting about Mini is they came to us and it wasn't, they didn't want to talk about Mini cars. They didn't even want to talk about Mini owners who were involved in feeding people in America or were philanthropic. What they said to me was, put on your journalism hat, put on your investigative hat, and go out and figure out why are 45 million Americans hungry or facing food insecurity in the world's richest country? Where 40% of our food actually goes to waste. We either throw it away, it rots in fields. They want its story. They didn't want an ad campaign. They didn't want a marketing campaign. They wanted to push buttons on people and say, in the world's richest country, why are people going hungry? So we went on the road, Our three, we did three major videos, um, one in a little town called St. Ignace, Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, one in Minneapolis, and one in Palm Springs, California. Palm Springs, California, a beautiful place, a desert paradise, very wealthy, has one of the highest incidents of childhood hunger in America, because there are a lot of migrant workers that live there. So this was an opportunity for me to sort of take what I know as a journalist and apply it to a problem and look at solutions and wow, many, for being supportive of such an idea, of saying, go for it. I don't need to, I don't need to approve it. I don't want to be along for the ride. I just want you to go do the work that you're going to do and come back and give us a report from the road. I have to say it was a, a grueling seven days that we were on the road for these three videos. And then we also did another storytelling, which I love to do, which is being on the road and turning around video in 24 hours. So we were also on the road with the mini drivers. And every morning we would get up and our videographer and reporter would go out and they would interview people in cities like Atlanta. So in Atlanta, there's this great nonprofit called Concrete Jungle. Um, and they go around and they pick fruit off of trees on public spaces and on private spaces because they found that Atlanta had a lot of fruit trees that the fruit was literally just falling off of the tree and moldering and mildewing and going to waste. So they're able to retrieve thousands of pounds of fruit that they take to food banks. And so we were on the road for a lot of time last year. And we were able to raise consciousness about hunger and food insecurity. But we were also able to really hear what does hunger look like in America, right? 
I mean, we're Americans. We have a lot of money. We have a lot of food everywhere. And you can buy food everywhere in America. And so in Lower Brule, South Dakota, on a Native American reservation, I think I heard the most profound thing I'd heard about hunger in America, which was, and again, story. Hunger in America, said this woman, is not like hunger in other countries. Hunger in America is a child living on this reservation who doesn't eat a fruit or vegetable for months on end. That's what hunger looks like in America. That's what malnutrition looks like in America. Now, for an advertiser to let you do something like that is pretty profound, but they believe in the art and the craft of storytelling. They're not necessarily there, at least in this program, to sell you a car. They're there to make sense of a big problem that they actually do know is important to their existing driver base and meant a lot to their drivers to be able to support Feeding America. So I'll move on to the next one as we um, get to the end of this. So this is the virtual reality program that we did for Morgan Stanley uh, late last year. Capital creates change. So this is our first foray into virtual reality. And I'm not going to show you the video in virtual reality because it's actually best sort of presented in a headset. And it wasn't until I'm not, I had not been a big fan of virtual reality. I thought it was sort of, yeah, everybody's in it, and it looks good, and you've got your headset on, and it's really cool, but I didn't really have a great appreciation for it, even when we were doing it, until I sat down um, in Toronto one day at a conference much like this, and Huffington Post was there with their partner called Riot. Um, and they put a headset on, and all of a sudden, I am dropped into Aleppo, Syria, a place I've never been, but a place that I now know intimately. It has been bombed. It has been gutted. You walk along the streets virtually, and you see the destruction in a way that a piece of journalism, traditional journalism, will never get you to. And then, all of a sudden, you're walking, you're wading through water up to your knees as you cross a river to get to a refugee camp. And then you're face to face with a refugee, a Syrian refugee, talking about what's happened to him and his family. You see the fear and the anguish and the sadness and the hope and the despair and everything that goes into that because you're literally right there with them. And so I do think that virtual reality is really, really powerful. Um, and in just a second, I'll cue the video um, because I actually think listening to the people here in a place called Kiriba, which is an island nation in the southern Pacific Ocean, um, which will probably be the first nation that becomes uninhabitable because of global climate change. And again, a very large investment bank like Morgan Stanley said, go halfway around the world and tell this story. So if I can cue the video for, it, um, for us, please. Kiribati has become the poster child for the climate change discussion. We're a constellation of atolls right at that front line where we're seeing the effects more drastically first. It's inevitable and nobody can argue whether it's happening or not happening. It's a reality. Now it's a household word, climate change. Our islands are left. The highest point is three meters above sea level. It's like the whole island is just barricaded against the ocean, house after house with their own seawall, trying to protect what land they have. The former government say we should migrate with dignity. When I go to a village, they are already dignified, even if they have nothing. Whatever they need traditionally and culturally is available. If you lose your land, you lose your identity. Who will I be really if I go to Fiji? I will lose that 
Kiribati's identity altogether. We created Kiribati Climate Action Network, a network of community-based groups and NGOs to advocate and to share our stories of climate change. We want this message out there reaching our people to really understand what are the impacts of climate change and how the community adapts to these changes. One of the activities we will do is planting of mangroves. It's a protection of the coast, but at the same time, it creates land. We try to educate our community people to learn this and to be able to take it to their communities. To me, that's already sustainable development or sustainable living. We don't need rocket scientists. We need serious contributors, problem solvers, ensuring that our children and their children do have a place. I don't want to move, sorry. If we ever move, we want to be a kid the best person wherever we go. I don't want to find a way and I can the atmosphere. I think the bigger countries need to learn from us. That community need is greater than the individual at this point. This globe is our home. Ours to share and say, if we are in that mindset, who do miracles? I think I'm out of time and I'm just going to leave, I'm just going to drop the mic on that one. Um, if we have any questions or comments. No, I, I do have a question. I think it was a very strong message in the end. And I think there is no controversy between making society better and making money, uh, where you can actually do both in combination. But sometimes it's a bit hard to, to reach out. And I mean, we, we uh, in equity, we, did, um, we normally only invest in Nordic companies, but then we came across a Finnish nuclear science who wanted to start selling used clothes uh, in Chicago, mm -hmm. in the US, in a company called Swap.com. Uh, and we are focusing, we are the market leader there in the US for selling pre uh, inexpensive used clothing. And in, in, in US, I mean, I think you're throwing away 30 kilos of clothing yearly. On the same time, you have, I mean, 30% work on minimum wage, 70% yep. working from paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. And there's a clear need of being able to reuse the clothing, which is, I think, in, it, to, be t to, care, t to take care of the environment, it's a really healthy uh, development. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you're using 30 kilos of water for producing one kilo of cotton. And then you, uh, I mean, it's, it's crazy. But at the same time, it's difficult in, I was thinking of your point on storytelling, who really, to really get across to the consumers and um, for them to realize the benefit in, uh, in buying used clothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do think that, um, you know, story does help us get closer. Um, it helps us get closer to our consumers. It also makes us feel closer. Yes. Um, but I think that it has to be, this isn't my favorite word, but it has to be authentic storytelling. Exactly. Um, and I think that sometimes that is, that is hard for brands and businesses who have been used to, in some ways, holding their, you know, their customers and consumers at a distance um, and sort of barricading themselves behind, you know, the brand mission and the brand guidelines and that you've got to say the brand this many times, um, that story can be a big step for a lot of companies. Um, but I think as you can see from Morgan Stanley and many and, and even Netflix, that when you do story well, it it captures you know it captures a lot more attention than a, tr a traditional ad. Completely agree. Yep. Very interesting speech. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thanks very much. Do what the day with just a little faith.